Hi, welcome to the session. We have 17 people who have come online. Thank you for being here. We are streaming on Facebook as well. We are now live. So if you'd like to share this, please do go to the jatka.org Facebook page and share it further. And uh, yes. So uh, Chiku, why, uh, why don't you share some of the questions that have come uh, so far from uh, the audiences in the registration form? Uh, yeah, we have on chat box, Jacob. Can you just check the chat box? Yeah, okay. We have, uh, we okay, so we have Arsh Saluja who's asked what to do when you spot a snake inside a building and when outside, uh, and when it's outside, how do we know if the snake is venomous or not? It'd be great if you could share. It's quite an in depth question, and uh, so do correct me if I'm wrong, you will be covering this in our talk, am I right? Yeah. I will be covering uh, some of those details, uh, though not in uh, total detail about identification because that's a separate subject altogether. And uh, for safety reasons, I may not go into it in also uh, great uh, length. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Fair enough. Uh, maybe we need a dedicated session just for that sometime in the future. Yeah. Mm. We have Ovia Jayashima asking for tips on rescuing urban wildlife for newly started NGOs. Kritika says she's not able to hear. Is there any, uh, if you can hear us clearly, can in the chat, can you please give us an asterisk or just say yes, can you hear us clearly, just a sound test before we start off, requesting the audience or is it just Kritika or is it, please type yes in the chat box, inviting the guest to please help us in our audio test. Chiku, please put this on full screen, the presentation. Okay, Galaxy M31 has says yes. Yes, Suparna can hear us. Thank you. Uh, Krita, sorry that you can't hear us, but uh, I think there might be an issue at your device end. All right. Great, okay. So we're gonna start the session now. Uh, Chitu, next slide, please. I'm just gonna set, no, uh, house rules. I'm just going to set some house rules to please be respectful of each other. This is a learning environment that we like to create, a fun but learning environment. Uh, do note that this webinar will be recorded and uh, be broadcast on Facebook. Uh, requesting whoever is using the pointer to please turn that off. Thank you so much. It's uh, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, please mute your microphone at all times. If at all we do hear background noise, we may interject and mute our microphone. Please don't mind that. We just try to keep this as a good learning experience for everybody. Uh, don't take it personally. It's just meant for the good of the group. We will open up for questions after the speaker has concluded a topic. There will be a break in between for question answers and at the end. Uh, please type your questions in the chat box only and we will stack them to make sure there is an orderly presentation of questions to the panelist Subaru today. In the interest of time, we may not be able to answer all questions during the session, which is just one hour long, but we will attempt to answer questions in our blog post that will follow up from the session next week. So uh, we will be sharing that. Uh, you can see on full screen, please. Uh, in the interest of healthy decorum, the admin reserves the right to maintain that uh, healthy learning ex experience. We reserve the right to maintain decorum, uh, which means if there's too much disturbance, we may have to put someone out of the uh, room itself. For further queries, please, uh, you can write to us at info.jatka.org with the subject line stories of rescuing wildlife in the subject line. Please make sure you have that string in the subject line or we will not find your question. Uh, sorry, Kritika, that you're not able to hear, but uh, the other audience members are saying they can hear us. Yeah, please. Uh, Shivani, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. All right. Uh, so our session today is in collaboration with the WRRC. I am going to, uh, they're doing some wonderful work online. I've, I've been following their work for a while online and we were very excited to the possibility of having them on board as part of our series of Local Ecology and You, which is a series designed to give audience members uh, 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 ways to learn how to protect and enhance their local ecology around them. And this includes animal rescue. And uh, next slide, please. With that, I'm going to hand it off to Subru. Subru, you can go back a slide, please, uh, Chico, so that Subru can take it from there. Over to you, Subru, please go for it. I'm going to mute. Yeah. 
Thanks, Jacob. Thanks, uh, Chiku. Uh, I, on behalf of uh, WRRC, would like to thank uh, JATKA and uh, LBB Bangalore for this opportunity to be able to speak to uh, the participants, uh, especially the citizens of Bangalore, and uh, share the knowledge that we have gained over the past so many years, actually two decades to be precise, uh, about urban wildlife. What we will be talking about is urban wildlife, uh, the rescue, and why urban wildlife is important for us. Uh, and before I, uh, Chiku, can I have the first slide, please? The next one, the starting, yeah. So uh, WRLC is, uh, next slide please, is uh, an organization that is dedicated to the uh, rescue and rehabilitation of urban wildlife, that's the wild birds and animals from Bangalore and the surround, uh, surrounding areas of Bangalore. So urban wildlife is all that you see, all the animals and birds other than the stray animals, that is dogs and cats and cows and donkeys, other than that, the squirrels, the, from the smallest bird, which is the flower pecker, to sunbirds, to the owl, the bat, the snake, the different rodents, all of that form a part of the urban wildlife. We have something called the urban ecosystem that has evolved around the uh, rapid urbanization of uh, human civilization. You know, we have been taking over the green spaces, creating our cities with uh, uh, literally uh, unplanned expansion, which has edged out uh, a lot of wildlife. And so the wildlife in the little way that they can, they have uh, adapted to our uh, expansion and created this urban ecosystem, which is also important for our survival. To put it in a very simple manner, uh, an example is uh, the black kite. They are good scavengers and they also hunt rodents, keeping the rodent population down. Snakes keep rodent population down, rodents which otherwise cause a lot of harm in terms of uh, destruction of uh, uh, crops and property and so on and so forth. That's a very, very base way of putting it, but just to illustrate the fact uh, about one, some of the importance is, uh, important uh, points that uh, urban wildlife uh, carry for us. And this was founded by uh, Cuba, which is uh, possibly the oldest animal welfare organization in uh, Karnataka, or if not India also. And uh, as, like I said, our expansion caused uh, displacement of urban wildlife. And uh, uh, because Cuba was focusing solely on uh, only stray and domestic animals, the need to look after the urban wildlife came up and thus uh, the Cuba trustees and a few other trustees got together, a few other like-minded people got together and established WRLC uh, 20 years, uh, two decades back. And we are uh, recognized by the Animal Welfare Board of India. That we work closely with the Karnataka Forest Department and, uh, and a few other organizations, the regulatory bodies as well. I will go into detail about our activities. Shiku, can I have the next slide, please? And right from the time that we were, uh, we started off, uh, the uh, WRC as an organization and its trustees have been part of uh, committees, both at the state, district, and national level. You know, like, uh, for example, we have been on the multiple, com uh, multiple committees uh, instituted by the Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change. Uh, we've been part of the Zoo Committee of the Central Zoo Authority, and uh, to name a couple. And we've been on district capital elephant monitoring, uh, capital elephant welfare monitoring uh, uh, committees also in both in Kerala, Tamil Nadu, and Karnataka. Uh, and uh, our trustees have won different awards across, like the Citizens Award uh, from Bangalore, Pride of Karnataka Award, and the first ever Nari Shakti Puraskar awarded by the uh, pre uh, President of India back in 2015. Uh, uh, so we have been active in this space for some time, and this is just to give you a background about how we work. And we have two projects that we are working on. Uh, Chiku, next slide, please. Uh, one is the Banargata Rehabilitation Center. Uh, if I'm speaking too fast, please let me know, everybody. Uh, we have the Banargata Re Rehabilitation Center, which is uh, situated inside the Banargata uh, National Forest. And uh, we have, it is a joint project with the Karnataka Forest Department. And we cater to the smaller animals, which is the displaced, injured, and often the urban wildlife. Also includes uh, the uh, animals that have been, the smaller animals that have been poached and confiscated by the Forest Department and the police force is also brought to us for care before they are released. And the other project we have is the elephant care facility in Malur in the Hospital Circle, where we house two elephants, two crippled elephants. More about them later. Next slide, please. So 
quickly as before we move on we have three hours like we have three hours reading arithmetic and so on writing we also have three hours which is rescue rehabilitation and release so rescue is where we are rescuing the animal either from poaching the picture there on your screen is uh, two uh, snakes that have been captured uh, they are boas actually uh, that have been captured from uh, the were confiscated by the force from the from poachers uh, who were going to sell them uh, into illegal captivity. Otherwise, rescue also includes inju injured animals. Uh, rescue also includes uh, uh, illegally kept animals, uh, illegally kept pets. And uh, <coughs> excuse me, once they are rescued and brought to us, they are treated for injuries that they may have, or if they are babies, they are uh, hand reared, and then they go into a process of rehabilitation, which is because of the length of period that they are with us or if they are pets especially they have they would have forgotten a lot of their wild behavior so they need to be rewilded so to speak we call it rewilding and they are then finally released into the wild so that is the three r's that we have and quickly going on to the next uh, slide uh, where i'm going to talk to you about uh, the uh, banargata rehabilitation center that the elephants that you see in that uh, in that picture are the wild elephants actually which are uh, regular visitors to our center and uh, we uh, right now do not uh, for the last one and a half i think no actually more than two years we do not have a fence because wild elephants have come and destroyed the fence fences time and again the last attack we had last visit i won't use the word attack uh, the last visit we had from them they destroyed the entire fence that uh, it was uh, we decided to let it be open and after all we are in their territory you know so and they have not caused any uh, really any damage so to speak to animals or human life so we let the fence be as it so why do we exist so this is the statement there all wildlife in india are the property of the state and protected under the wildlife protection act 1972 and keeping them captive or injuring them is illegal and a cognizable offense Cognizable by cognizable, I mean is that a case can be registered. A case can be registered against uh, the person who is committing this crime against the wildlife. And any issues, uh, Jigar? So I wanted to interject and also after you're done with the point, but what is the property of state? What does that mean? Uh, good, good, good point, uh, Jacob. A very good point. The property of the state, uh, as in. Uh, Wildlife in India is protected, uh, not just the wildlife, all flora and fauna, that is plants included, are protected under the Wildlife Protection Act under five schedules. And whatever is listed under these five schedules doesn't belong to anybody, but belongs to the state. So keeping them captive or injuring them is, goes up against, you are uh, uh, committing illegal acts against what belongs to the state. That is what is meant by the property of the state. So. I hope that makes it that drives the point more clear that uh, uh, handling wildlife is actually illegal. So uh, India has quite a few laws uh, that protect animals, and if you look at under the uh, the hammer or the gavel, there is uh, there is a link. Uh, Jatka will be uh, sharing this uh, deck with you, and uh, uh, this link links to something that has been put out by uh, Humane Society International India through Better India. Uh, which lists the 15 points, 15 laws that are critical for animal protection in India. But uh, I'm not going to go into detail about these laws because that is subject for another discussion altogether, you know. But uh, I would just like to stop there uh, and tell you about the Constitution of India, uh, where uh, under Article 51G, uh, we have, uh, uh, where it is under the fundamental duties of every citizen that we will try to uh, safe, protect our wildlife, animals, and environment from damage and destruction. And India was among the very few constitutions in the world where animal rights was enshrined in the constitution. Reality is different, we all know, but uh, we have it. We have these things, so it is about how we use it. And Prevention, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act uh, is actually deals with uh, only domestic and uh, strays, but uh, Section 11.1 and 11.2 uh, deals with uh, what constitutes the uh, what constitutes cruelty to animals. So, if read along with Wildlife Protection Act, uh, we can uh, build a solid case against uh, the perpetrators of uh, wildlife crime. And every state has uh, uh, police acts. For instance, uh, 
section 93 of the Karnataka Police Act of uh, Karnataka Police Act uh, states about what is cruelty to animals, and uh, that can be applicable to uh, uh, wildlife uh, crime as well. And yes, uh, Jacob, you're mute. Uh, are there animals that are not covered under these acts? Because I understand it's it's almost you can't have an exhaustive list. Uh, so is there anything that's not covered under these? Good, good question, actually. Uh, uh, excellent question because uh, uh, I said we, there are five schedules under the Wildlife Protection of uh, India Act, uh, but uh, there is a sixth schedule which covers some animals which are called the vermin. Like uh, uh, for. I'm not going to state which animals are there because that was the wrong on my part because people may think they don't need protection and won't do it. But uh, some of these, are, some animals are not listed under the five schedule uh, and are listed under schedule six, which uh, uh, technically are not protected under the act. But schedule one to five uh, are uh, on the basis of the, the status of uh, how endangered they are. Schedule one is highly, contains all the highly criti uh, and critically endangered animals and also are uh, uh, national animal, national bird. The national bird is not really endangered, but uh, uh, the pea, pea fowl or the peacock is listed under Schedule 1. Hope that uh, makes answers your question. Thank you. And uh, the municipal, the individual municipal corporation acts also are uh, uh, contain uh, uh, relevant sections. Why I am covering those two is so that in case you decide to take up a complaint, these are the ones that you should be able to uh, use. And Jacob has kindly shared the link in the chat that will enumerate all the relevant sections from whatever I have listed here now. Uh, next slide, please. So I just want to, I'll just take it through some of our patients very quickly. I'm not going to spend too much time. So like I said, we receive animals from different uh, sources, uh, you know, so to speak, you know. The first one is the Indian chameleon was uh, confiscated uh, from the illegal pet trade from one of the markets around Bangalore. And uh, he was, uh, Mildly injured, we were able to release them as uh, very quickly compared to some of the other uh, other cases. The second one is a spiny tail lizard uh, was confiscated by the Indian Customs at the Bangalore International Airport where they were being uh, smuggled out. And uh, these animals are not, uh, they were smuggled out in bottles, small plastic bottles. And uh, uh, these are not in, uh, endemic to South India. They are endemic to the West India, the Western deserts, like uh, the Kutch area to be more precise. And, uh, in Gujarat and they were very badly injured so they were with us for quite some time and uh, once they were uh, completely healthy we got permission and took them and released them in Gujarat in the Kutch area. So that's one of the very interesting cases we have. The, the other one is a common fox. So it's an indirect uh, poaching case. Uh, why I call it indirect poaching case is uh, this animal he was kept as a pet because he was found abandoned often as a little pup. And the fam a family in the village uh, adjoining the forest found him and reared him thinking he's a dog. Till one of our rescuers saw him and uh, brought him back to our center where he was uh, put through uh, uh, what we call dehumanizing uh, uh, of, uh, and rewilding. And finally, when we were releasing him, he was very shy of humans, which is, a, uh, which is the, the, the success factor. And... Uh, he used to roam around the center for a little bit and then finally we stopped seeing him and he would visit us once in a way and the frequency started reducing which meant he has, he has found he found a mate and moved on in life so to speak you know next please so the russell stan boa is a victim of uh, conflict which is uh, basically if you look at his markings he is quite similar to a very venomous snake called the russell's uh, wiper and people panicked, and if you notice the bandage, uh, he was beaten right across the middle, breaking his back. But uh, we were fortunately able to, our doctor, Dr. Rupa, she has great success rate with our animals, a brilliant wildlife vet that we have, who is the mainstay along with our re uh, chief rehabilitator and center supervisor, Anand Nair, who, is, who will be the person who will answer your call when you call. Uh, we're able to immobilize that section and he, it was a long, uh, long time, but he recovered and we were able to uh, release the animal uh, uh, successfully. The next one, okay, the, here uh, Jacob advised me if I have uh, gory cases to uh, give a trigger warning. So the, this case and something else that I'll be talking in relation will have some trigger warnings here. This rock eagle owl was used for black magic. So there is this whole uh, superstitious belief uh, 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 there is a 
superstitious belief that uh, uh, using animals for black magic can uh, help you overcome your difficulties or destroy your enemies and so on and so forth. So this rock eagle owl, which is a huge and beautiful bird, was uh, used for black magic. When we got him, uh, owls have four talents. We found that he had a fifth talent thrown to his, both his feet. Uh, and it had turned gangrenous and it was in the danger of, uh, you know, uh, it was so bad that it was in danger of uh, amputation. But thanks to the great work by our uh, rehabilitators and our doctor, he recovered completely and we were able to release him. And staying on the topic of wild uh, black magic, there are a couple of others, you know. <laughs> uh, there, uh, there is a very cute animal called the Slender Loris. I'm sorry I didn't add a photo of him. Uh, uh, it's a very beautiful primate with bulging eyes. It's like the lemurs you see in Madagascar. A very similar looking animal, uh, but uh, beautiful, very cute, very slow moving, which makes them easy to catch. You shine a light on them, they stop. So, um, and they're very critically endangered and there are only two or three pockets in the city where you can find them. I'm not going to say which pocket. Uh, so these, these, these animals are used as living voodoo dolls. So they heat iron nails and poke them poke it into these animals while they're living uh, and use for voodoo black magic. It's the same thing that, so if I pierce the heart, it is believed that the enemy would, uh, your uh, enemy would suffer from a heart attack. So uh, it's a very unfortunate thing. And uh, we are trying to fight the superstitious belief along with the Wildlife Crime Bureau. And uh, hopefully we will see the, some change over time, you know. And uh, there's another one, the black kite, which is a very common uh, animal you find across the city. You know, if you look up the bird, you think is an eagle, but has a forked tail. It's a black kite, actually. Uh, and uh, uh, they, they, they clip the feathers of the flight feathers, clip their talon, and clip their bill or the beak in the belief that the, uh, while this animal will die of starvation, your enemy will also die of starvation. But in reality, what is happening is this animal will... Uh, die a very slow, painful death, bleeding. So that's, that's what uh, typically happens. So please, uh, if you hear of black magic, uh, list the phone, inform us, inform the forest department so that uh, we can uh, come in and rescue whatever animal may be. Uh, yes, uh, Jacob? I'm gonna jump in there and ask, is there any legal action that we've taken against black magic practitioners? Uh, what can be done about the actual people perpetrating such acts? <clears throat> Good question. Uh, I will be covering that a little later in the uh, in the session, but I'll answer this here. Uh, do not attempt to, uh, if anyone few hear about this, do not attempt to engage, but try to gather evidence and uh, let us know or uh, inform the forest department uh, through their vigilance cell or their helpline. Uh, and they will get into action with these people. Because if you try to intervene, these people, especially the black magic pra practitioners are uh, very powerful in terms of connection and uh, connections and support from the local people. So you might end up uh, getting harmed yourself rather than being able to save the animal. But try to collect as much evidence and get the uh, authorities involved. Or if you don't want to speak to the authorities directly, call us, we will interface with the authorities. I hope that answers your question. Uh, next, uh, quickly, uh, the Indian star tortoise again is, uh, we can go on to the next one. Uh, the Indian star tortoise is also being used in the illegal pet trade and also for a belief that they are Vastu compliant. I don't know how animals can be Vastu compliant, uh, but uh, unfortunately what happens with a lot of these animals, they feed them the wrong food and uh, they also, they are ter terrestrial animals. They, but uh, people think uh, tortoises are, uh, so a quick uh, point here to uh, differentiate between a tortoise and a, uh, and a turtle is uh, tortoises have domed shells, as you can see in this uh, uh, in this uh, picture. You, you can see that they have a domed shell, whereas turtles will have a more flat shell to give them a streamlined shape while they swim in the water. So what happens is they pick up these uh, tortoises and put them in water, literally, uh, typically drowning them. You know, so. Uh, these, these animals are not meant to be in captivity. They're meant to be in the wild. Anyhow, going on to the next one, the gray mongoose, which is a very common mongoose in India. Uh, this one was brought to us as an orphan uh, and uh, we were able to, again, release him, rewild him and uh, rehabilitate him and release him in, in the wild uh, close to our center itself, but not within our center. And the last one is, again, uh, I've 
chosen the cases I chose is to show you the kind of different kind of cases uh, that we get. Uh, tree felling is the case here, which is an indirect uh, result of our activity. From Jayanagar, when a tree was felled for road widening purposes, we got a call to rescue this white cheek barbet along with four of his siblings. Uh, and we, our rescuer did look around the fallen tree, but uh, didn't find. So we are presuming there were no more uh, uh, babies, but the adults like squirrels and other tree dwelling animals, arboreal animals, would have escaped. Yeah, next slide, please. The elephant care facility is in Malur. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, is uh, is uh, where we house two elephants, Anisha. Uh, she is uh, 50, 52 actually. Uh, we are guessing 50. Uh, uh, she is a former logging elephant who was crippled in an accident and then was changed hands so many times and was used for begging and before she was finally uh, rescued and brought to us. And we have Gauri, a former temple and begging elephant, uh, who both of who have become inseparable and are living their life free of chains. This is a no chain facility. And they are living a life of dignity where we there's no demands made of this. You know, uh, I'll just stop to give you an anecdote about Anisha, who, uh, who walks very stiffly because of the accident, her elbows are fused. And she hates the cold. And uh, when she was uh, being, uh, she walked very stiffly and slowly. And when she was being taken to have a bath on one cold morning, she was moving extra slowly and very painfully. When the Mahao told her, "Okay, you can, uh, you don't need to bathe," and she turned around and walked fast back into her shelter. You know, <laughs> uh, she she is uh, so that's the kind of uh, they're, they're spoiled. They're spoiled rotten by all of us. So. That's, that's the long and short of uh, our elephant care activity. And uh, can we move to the next slide? Our other activities include uh, the, uh, we have an RO plant, uh, reverse osmosis water plant in uh, uh, the elephant facility, uh, which is in a village which had welcomed us with open arms. And we've tried to make it as inclusive as possible. So what we did is uh, the uh, RO provides portable water to the uh, villagers. And the runoff, you know that RO can only process 40% of the water that is pumped in. So the runoff is used to fill the tank that is the, the tank that is used by the elephants to play in. And we, the water that is emptied from the tank goes to water the grass, the fields of grass that the villagers are growing to sell back to us as grass for the fodder for the elephants. So there is a lot of inclusion that we uh, try to maintain there with the villagers because we need, we are really thankful to them for accommodating us with uh, open arms and hearts. Then we uh, we have both legal advocacy and outreach. Legal advocacy is uh, we have filed cases for multiple things, including challenging some of the vermin uh, declarations, the vermin orders by different governments. We have a Supreme Court case running about capital and welfare running in the Supreme Court since 2014. And we also have outreach where we work with children, or even this webinar is an example of an outreach where we try to educate you about uh, wildlife, urban wildlife, and how we can handle them. And workshops uh, where we work with wildlife volunteers, with schools, with uh, uh, even the uh, forest department mahouts and food care workshop for uh, different uh, mahouts and all of those. Because these are an ongoing process because uh, these practices are set and it will take multiple attempts to get them to change their welfare uh, uh, practices, you know. So going on to the next uh, question, what do you do? Which is what this uh, Webinar is so this much was the introduction to WRC and uh, activities and so now coming to the educational part uh, What do you do when you come across an injured or displaced animal? So before you intervene what uh, we would like to request you before you actually do it there needs to be a visual assessment of the animal and uh, uh, What do you uh, Follow what is called the five C. We call it the five C. Chiku can I have the next slide please? Is the animal crying? Because uh, crying, uh, so when I say uh, is the animal crying, is the animal crying incessantly, not like the usual chirps and the uh, grunts or the roars or the bark or whatever the uh, individual animals may be making. Uh, uh, beyond, over and beyond that, is, it, is the animal crying incessantly and uh, seemingly in distress? Or is the animal coming towards you? Wild animals, as a rule, keep away from humans. So before, usually, more often than not, even you won't be knowing, is uh, when you're walking out in in the in the wooded areas or whatever, they, uh, be assured that there would have been snakes around you. They have gone because they hear you approaching. But is the animal coming towards you in a non-aggressive manner? Then 
Yes, the animal probably is in distress. Or is the animal covered in blood, feces, maggots, food, insects, or whatever? Especially in the case of babies, you know, because a healthy baby is kept clean by the uh, mother. But if uh, the uh, uh, if the baby is injured or hurt, the uh, mother at certain cases may abandon the uh, the baby. It's, it's, a, it's a part of their survival uh, techniques, you know. They cannot be burdened by an injured baby and they will not be able to move. So they would uh, leave the animal behind. So if that is the case, yes. Or is the animal caught in something like a kite string or a net or a fence? Or uh, uh, is it in a, is the animal in a unnatural uh, surrounding? Like has it has the animal wandered onto a highway? Then yes, you need an intervention. But if it is a, a snake uh, swallowing, say a squirrel, I use a squirrel because yes, squirrels are also prey to snakes. But squirrel is a cute animal, and you may be tempted to rescue it. But you are interfering in the flow of nature, and you are depriving the snake of the of his meal. So do not intervene when it is like that. Or is the animal feeling cold? It's trembling and shivering. You can see it. It's a visual assessment. So you may get a tick mark for all five, or even if you get a tick mark for one of these, then intervention is required. Next slide, please. And in that case, you call for a wildlife rescuer. But before intervention, please remember when handling and uh, transport also causes additional trauma to the animal. So, which is why we said do the five feet test. Because if uh, handling causes a lot of trauma and we have lost animals while or en route to the center or on the operating table or during examination or during tra uh, a treatment uh, because of what we call, what our doctor calls capture myopathy. Uh, it causes further shock and the animal can go into total shock and uh, lose, its, uh, lose their life, you know. And in the case of babies, please ascertain whether the baby can be reunited with their mothers because that gives them the uh, biggest chance of survival. And when uh, we say uh, check whether the baby can be uh, uh, reunited with their mother doesn't mean they're coming and checking every five minutes, you know, has the mother come, has the mother come. That, will call, that is counterproductive because the mother will definitely abandon the baby then because you see a threat. Yes, uh, Jacob, have you received another question? And, um, no, I'm just going to jump in there and ask you uh, just to visualize an example of uh, trying to reunite with the mother. If you can give like two animals examples where you waited it out till the mothers uh, came back. Well, yeah, okay. One of the most common ones is uh, a, 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 a fledgling or a chick that has fallen from a nest. So that, there, yes, you need an intervention. See if you can see the nest around and you can definitely place the baby back gently. If you can't, get the rescuer to do it for you because uh, uh, it, is a, it is a false belief that if a human touches a baby bird or a fledgling, the mother will reject the baby. No, it is not true. You just you just have to put the baby back, and uh, the mother will because the mother would be hopping around in distress, uh, close by. You know that is one. And in the case of uh, a fallen, let's say a macaque who has fallen down and uh, uh, may not be moving, the mother may be hesitant to approach because there are humans nearby. So gently move the. Uh, uh, so you would typically find the fallen baby near a tree or from a building. So move the the baby to a slightly sheltered area and clear the area from uh, the, move all the humans around from there and wait and watch from a very safe distance to see if the mother comes and reclaims the baby. So does that uh, illustrate the point more? It does. Well, yes. I love to ask another question. Uh, I, I was going to say this is a common myth about uh, human hands touching an animal, the mother. Uh, fair enough, it's a myth. Uh, but is it advisable for sake of disease or just like to avoid human smell, to use gloves or a blanket or something to actually handle the, the avoid. Good point. Very good point. Uh, yes, uh, from a safety standpoint, and yes, uh, these animals do carry pathogens and uh, other uh, insects, you know, like ticks and other things. So it would be safe to use a glove, soft glove, uh, if possible, or wrap the animal with a little small soft towel and uh, take it up, uh, take the animal into the nest. Yeah. Next slide, please. Any questions? Yes, we do have some questions. We have Angana Lama who's asking. Uh, I'm just going to paste it here for your convenience. She yeah. is asking uh, if this. I don't know if this is a relevant question. Uh, let me paste it first in chat. She's saying. 
I don't know if this is a relevant place to ask this question, but I want to know about the incident that happened two months ago where an elephant was fed a bomb as fruit. And uh, that was a famous case, went viral on social media. Uh, what do you want to say about that? Who do we blame? And what actions can be taken for that horrible action? Uh, it's a fair emotional question. Uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people want to hear the answer to that as well. Yeah, what do you think, Silvu? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a good, it's, a, it's actually a relevant question because, uh, yes, it is a conflict issue. And uh, there is no one single person to blame here. It is a very uh, it's an intricate uh, and a complex issue uh, which has multiple factors to it. Uh, we cannot blame the farmer because the farmer is looking for his livelihood. The elephant cannot be blamed because uh, humans are to be blamed because we are, we are encroaching into their territory and uh, they come into human habitation into field searching for food. And uh, there are multiple things that can be done to keep uh, elephants, uh, elephants and other wild animals away from the field of farmers. But uh, A, we do not have an infrastructure in place to do that, like, you know, build elephant proof trenches. Uh, or uh, put up electric fences to prevent elephants from coming in, or elephant-proof fencing also. Uh, and the forest department itself is highly understaffed. So these are the things. So I saw a lot of chagrin and indignation online on social media about blaming the farmer and uh, saying that he needs to go to hell, he needs to be arrested, he needs to be... Uh, and so, I mean, so many things uh, being bad mouth. But actually, what we need to do is fight for better laws uh, an implementation of the various welfare schemes. Even even the insurance, the farmer, if uh, his crop is uh, uh, destroyed by elephants, there are insurance schemes. But by the time he gets it, it's going to be a very long time, and what he gets will be a small portion also because there are so many bribes to be paid that he needs to get it. But that needs to be fought for. We need to fight for uh, filling up the forest force, the vacancies. Uh, there is uh, the forest, uh, the different forest departments. I can speak for Karnataka and Kerala for sure. I don't know about the other departments. But I am reasonably sure that they're also very understaffed. Uh, fight for getting those vacancies filled so that the forest department can uh, impart their duties better. I hope that answers the question. So it's a very complex issue and there's no one person who can be uh, done. Uh, uh, Sharonan has uh, corrected uh, a mistake in my uh, PP in my deck. Uh, the rock, Indian rock python is uh, Schedule 1 and not uh, Schedule 4 as erroneously put in my uh, paper. So thank you. And somebody's asking if she can unmute herself. Yes, actually, but allow me to just ask a quick question, uh, which was built on the last uh, point of discussion about the elephant-human uh, conflict. Uh, is it true that elephant populations have been growing because of quite good work by the forest departments that uh, elephants are actually uh, increasing? Uh, elephant populations are increasing to a point that uh, forests can't handle that. Is that true, or is that just uh, no? That's not true. Yeah. That's not. Uh, that's not true. I don't want to. Uh, uh, I don't have the figures offhand, uh, but uh, it has not reached a point where, uh, unlike the population of lions, which is becoming overpopulated in gear alone, uh, we do not have that kind of uh, the uh, burst in population that uh, people are actually claiming because of which there is conflict uh, happening. The conflict is happening primarily because of shrinking habitat and also fragmentation of the habitat. Because the, if you look at it, it's a, a contiguous corridor from here to the Nilgiris and all of that. Uh, it's being fragmented, or if you take in the Corbett site, the Ramnagara division in Corbett and all of those, it's being fragmented because of the proliferation of uh, wildlife resorts and all of those. So populations are getting fragmented and isolated that they are not able to do their annual migration. So the short answer to it is no, the population has not increased the way we, uh, we would really love it or the elephant scholars would love to have it increased. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we have uh, a Galaxy has asked a question. Uh, I, will, uh, I will be happy to engage with you after at the end of it. Uh, Jacob, please take a note of that. Yes, noted. Uh, Galaxy M31, we will take that conversation directly. If you can uh, DM me your contact details, I will make sure that... Uh, uh, Sudo gets it and you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But for the sake of the group, I'm going to have to push that cycle that rack that conversation. So please DM me your contact details, Galaxy N331. But uh, we have a request from Sakshi Parma to unmute herself. Please come on board, Sakshi. Please, you're welcome to uh, uh, go ahead and ask the question. You're welcome to even put on your camera to see your face. It would be lovely to see you. Yeah, actually, I'm not able to switch on my camera. Laptop just crashed down, so I'm just able to speak. Uh, so yeah, 
so there have been many instances where i've come across that i could see some dog that is injured on the road or maybe some bird that is you know injured and fallen down and then i really have that urge to actually go out help it but then what is it i will definitely call up the helpline numbers but before they reach how is it that i could take a step i could maybe pick it up put it up on the side on a pedestal or maybe you know do something to comfort that animal for the moment so how do i pick it up maybe with a pl- uh, with a, the leaves fallen off the tree maybe in that should i wrap it up if i don't have a cloth or just with my bare hand so how is it that i could take care before the actual help arises yeah, uh, good question sakshi uh, so i will be covering that a little later in the in in the session so uh, i hope right, wait for right. a couple of, i think in the next couple of slides i'll be covering that uh, question all right thank you so much uh, not next slide uh, two three slides down so can we So now we are coming to the most glamorous part of uh, wildlife rescue handling snakes uh, how many of you have been waiting for that uh, yeah, go back to the previous slide please uh, can i have a yes on that uh divya yes there is volunteering work uh, i have it on the last slides uh, okay so there are two three people who have said yes uh, uh and shivani adas there are effective online petition space change.org in support of animal welfare calls what else can we do to fight issues related to this uh, shivani the best way you can do is to either volunteer with uh, these wildlife organizations or donate to them or passively adopt passively adopt is because you cannot take a uh, take a wild animal home you can adopt passively adopt an animal for example if we have uh, in drc we have wrc we have a a uh, cobra under care you can passively adopt the snake and uh, pay for the care of that snake till the snake is released so these are two or three of the things that you can do also volunteer with us in terms of uh, working to create awareness conducting workshops these are some of the few things that you can do all right uh, and uh, going on to snakes how do you handle snakes don't handle them call a trained snake catcher there is no way i you can handle a snake whether they are venomous or not uh we do not recommend common people for citizens handling snakes because uh, somebody saying something okay going on uh, because even if it's uh, if the snake is not a venomous snake a bite can be painful and it can be mildly poisonous because uh, i won't say mildly poisonous it could be it could result in an infection also so let's not handle snakes and it's uh, it's not an easy job to identify all the venomous snakes because uh, end of the day we have over 60 species of venomous snakes in india but i will cover some of the common ones uh, in the, in this session uh spectacle cobra naga naga or what you call the nagara naga uh, is uh, one of the most common venomous snakes in india uh, identifiable by the hood and the two spectacles or the mark of vishnu as it's also known as on his hood the next is the banded crate uh, which is also a fairly common snake uh, Uh, and highly venomous uh, uh, and there are some snakes which are banded and look similar to the banded crate uh, but uh, the banded crate is easily uh, uh, identifiable by the double banding it has and the rounded uh, head uh, uh, the slightly pointy rounded head that uh, he has and the most infamous uh, russell's viper because of which the, his uh, counterpart uh, or his nemesis is the russell python who gets hurt because he looks similar to the uh, russell's viper is another one look at the marking that marking is what you can use for identifying and of course unlike the python he has a very pointed head vipers have very pointed head the next one is the soft tail viper which is a which has got a bl- uh, slightly bluntish head and uh, his uh, look at the marking so those are the ways you can identify i'm just uh, showing you six of the uh, most common venomous snakes that we have in india and this fellow is really fast and uh, he is small and really fast and the next is of course the king the king cobra grows to length of 2 uh, meters at 6 feet and more and he a very interesting fact about the king cobra is he can raise up he or she can raise up to half his body size uh, body length up into the air normally snakes as you can see in this picture they raise only so much uh, but uh, the uh, king cobra as a part of his uh, part of his intimidation tactics can raise himself up uh, up to half the body length and he is also highly venomous and the last one is the malabar fish viper i mean uh, 
he's an arboreal snake. So he can come from the top of the trees while you're walking in the forest and uh, strike you. But uh, uh, yeah, these are the six uh, common snakes. And some of the other ways of identifying snakes are uh, uh, the the uh, uh, they have uh, uh, circular, uh, smaller scales on their head and uh, uh, lateral scale, uh, lateral shields are there, but I don't want to get into that in detail because that's more, that's a total, uh, totally different uh, physiology of uh, physiology and anatomy of snakes class. But uh, just remember these guys. And one quick tip about uh, snakes is that uh, when a snake, if at all, when if you get bitten by a snake, if you have got two puncture marks then they are, uh, you have been bitten by a venomous uh, snake and you need to go for treatment immediately. I will cover that in the slide, in the slide about uh, what to do when, get, when you're bitten by a snake. But uh, a quick recap of about uh, snake proofing your apartment or society. Lighting is a very key thing. Ensure that all pathways are well lit. Do not switch, a lot of residents welfare associations switch off uh, the lights at, at the first light of the day, you know, don't do that. Let it be fully, let uh, the sun rise and let it be fully lit by natural light before you switch off the light. Keep your area, garbage management is very important. Keep it clean, keep it clear of garbage because garbage attracts rodents. Rodents are natural uh, prey for snakes. Snakes follow them. And your gardens, all, all your houses are going for landscaping. Discourage, do not plant low dense shrubs. Don't use rock gardens and those things. Keep your gardens free of debris and litter, which means clear the uh, dry uh, leaves and all of those. Keep your pots one foot away from the wall because, again, this uh, keeping the pots against the wall creates a dark, cold space. So uh, uh, snakes are cold, cold-blooded animals. They're reptiles. They come into the sun to warm, and when the uh, when the temperature becomes hot, uh, unbearable for them, or when they've gathered the required body heat, they go into a cool place. And these pots against the wall give them cool uh, resting places. And make sure your housekeeping staff or you, if it's a house, you check all the nooks and crannies very often. And going back again, the debris and storage of all these uh, uh, excess construction material and apartments as a part of dry waste, dry waste management, they tend to pile them up, creating cool spaces for snakes to rest. So make sure you don't do that. Then common uh, area toilets, uh, please go back. Uh, Common area toilets and uh, all of those, uh, please make sure the lids of the, or even in your house, if you're a house, a one floor house, uh, or a house with your own backyard, all this is applicable. Close toilet doors, close the lids of commodes, uh, put mesh on all the outlets. You allow the uh, sewage to flow out, but you don't allow rodents and snakes to come in. And there are a lot of people who feed animals, uh, which includes stray animals. Please do feed. I'm not asking you not to feed the stray animals, but do not feed uh, wild animals. Uh, Please clean up after you feed them. So if you're feeding, if you have a habit of feeding dogs and cats around your locality, please feed them using, uh, put the food on the paper and take it away once the animal is eaten because leaving it around attracts rodents, which in turn attack, attracts snakes. So these are the quick points. This deck will be shared with you. You can screenshot it if you want, but uh, uh, Jacob and the uh, Jatka team will be sharing it with you. So you can use this as a reference. Next slide, please. In case of snake bites, Quickly, I'll run you through them, but uh, please remember, this is not medical advice. We are not, none of us are medical practitioners, but please be careful. Uh, snake proofing will allow you to not be bitten by snake, uh, by snake but uh, nevertheless, if unfortunately you get bitten, remove any jewelry or watches because uh, uh, if you're bitten, let's say on your arm, the area will swell up and a watch or a bracelet will cut into your skin uh, causing a fresh injury and also uh, giving uh, cutting off the blood flow. And try to keep the uh, area, usually it is the hand or the leg where you get bitten, keep it below the heart, so which means lay the patient down. Remain still and calm. Do not try to remove the clothes of the person because that causes more movement and uh, causes faster circulation. You know, and uh, clean the uh, bite wound. Don't do this, uh, all this biting of the wound and sucking the blood and all of those things. Please don't do it as all uh, nonsense. It's myth. You, actually, if you bite and suck or you cut the wound, you are increasing chance of infection and adding a secondary infection for the person, for that, uh, for the poor person, you know. And if you ha have seen the snake, please uh, try to see, uh, don't kill the snake, just uh, see what snake it is and uh, maintain a visual identity so that you can tell the doctor. Uh, about the snake and uh, you'll be able to identify uh, the snake. Next uh, slide, please. 
Uh, by the way, the picture I have used is not a venomous snake that's the head of a python. Uh, what not to do? Do not ice the area. There are chances of blocking circulation. Like I said, do not suck the blood out, suck the out with the mouth. Do not tonicate the wound. That is, tonicate is tie the, uh, people tie a tonicate or a cloth or a rubber tubing above the bite area to block the flow of blood. Just don't do that. Use, use splints and bandages or dupattas and all those strips of cloth. Use two pieces of stick and uh, immobilize the area. Uh, just to uh, prevent movement and uh, do not attempt to cut the wound. You Cutting the wound is, uh, uh, is, uh, is going to cause more infection uh, uh, than uh, being a cure, you know. And uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, I remember I told you that two, uh, the, uh, identifying the based on the bite, two puncture marks and it will bleed continuously, whereas the other one will be from the upper jaw, uh, the uh, maxilla, so there will be multiple little tooth marks and the bleeding will stop quickly or it will be just like pinpricks and little droplets of blood forming. So uh, do not attempt to guess whether the snake was, uh, uh, when I'm, though I told you this, do not try to guess whether the snake was harmless or not. Please go in for treatment straight away. That is most important. Yes, uh, Jacob. Uh, for treatment, is it better to go to a wet hospital or a human hospital? How do you identify which hospital is better? Let's just go to almost uh, all hospitals. Yeah, good question. Almost all hospitals have anti venom in uh, stock. And uh, the primary healthcare centers, I mean, the government hospitals definitely do have it, uh, but it would be good if you are active on the field as a wildlife rescuer, it would be good to check with the government hospital whether they have stock of uh, 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 the anti venom with them or not. Uh, it's best to go to a hospital rather than a vet because, uh, yes, wildlife, our wildlife center does have a, uh, a stock of anti venom, but then reaching us is going to be impractical you would reach a hospital faster than going to a vet. And there are not too many wildlife vets who are in the city, so they may not be stocking anti-venom. Uh, some pharmacies sell anti-venom. Uh, what do you advise about that? Is it advisable to keep it or what? Sorry? Some, some uh, pharmacies keep anti-venom. They sell anti-venom. What do you do? You have any comment on this? Is this a thing that people should keep at home if they live in a farm? Or what, or so, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you're living in farms, yes, you can keep uh, anti-venom, but I would recommend not self-administering uh, anti-venom uh, because uh, there are multiple things that go into deciding uh, the uh, uh, the uh, usage of venom. And uh, somebody has said, uh, yes, uh, uh, Angana has made a valid point. I'll, I'll bring that up. Uh, uh, and Shravan has just uh, mentioned uh, that there is, uh, uh, we use a polyvalent antivenom dose which can be, yeah, exactly the point that uh, Shravan has just made to me on the side is uh, uh, not to administer venom, antivenom by yourself because dosage can be unique according to the snake and according to the victim, the size and all of those things. And uh, what uh, Lama says is that in research in uh, Nepal, most of, most of the people die after snake bite due to heart it's more from shock. A lot of people go into shock because of the bite more than uh, the uh, uh, the not getting medical treatment. Yes, uh, uh, Lama, it is, uh, we have seen that here also because a lot of uh, bites, uh, this is, I do not have uh, the reference papers ready with me, but uh, discussions with multiple vets, including ours, has shown that the uh, cobras and uh, the, uh, some of these snake bites are dry bites because they would have already had, especially the ones that happen early in the morning, uh, would be a dry bite rather than a wet bite, which is injection of the uh, venom. Uh, why I said early in the morning is probably because the animal would have eaten the previous night and the venom, venom would have been expended into the prey animal. So the uh, uh, usually it is not a dangerous bite, but uh, the shock is what causes more of the uh, a cardiac arrest is what happens. But uh, timely, regardless of whatever I tell you now, I would, I would want to stop this because I don't want to create a false confidence in people. Uh, if you are bitten by a snake, people go see a doctor, get yourself treated straight away. Don't attempt any of the country cures. Salt and chilies cannot cure you. Smoking uh, a candle also will not be able to uh, cure you. It is, you need medical treatment, period. Yeah. The next thing that I wanted to touch upon is uh, the macaque menace. It's not a menace, folks. They are victims. 
they are victims because uh, they are uh, we are eaten up into the green space they don't have place to go and uh, they are they come to us and because they are in search of food and it is illegal to hurt them so if you are trying to if you beat them you are liable to be prosecuted and they cannot be uh, translocated from where they are so if you have macaques living outside your apartment complexes you cannot move them they cannot be translocated period it is illegal to translocate them and uh, you can be slapped with a solid case uh uh is making another good point uh, uh which yes uh, administering of the anti snake venom patient may go into depression and needs a shot of adrenaline uh it cannot even be done in a primary health uh, healthcare center in a phc only a, a better medical center so fortis does have uh, anti venom uh that's a good place to go as well because one of uh, pfas batch was bitten by a snake and uh, he was treated in fortis Anyhow, coming back, uh, yeah. So there is no solution to the the predicament of macaques. We have to coexist with them, so view them with compassion. And I can just tell you a few things uh, about yes. Go ahead. I think you're you. going to address. I'm sure you're going to address the point anyway. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, uh, there is uh, there are some ways we we can help them uh, stop them from actually uh, being a menace, as you call it. Oh, before I go on, I, there was a very important point that I had to make regarding snakes. Uh, once you get a rescuer and rescue the snake, please do not ask the rescuer to show you the snake and take a selfie with the snake and all of those things. That you are causing more trauma to the animal because while the uh, the, the rescuer takes enough care to uh, not hurt the snake, being handled is a trauma by itself for the animal. So the animal already is aggressive and trying to. grandstand with the snake for the sake of a selfie the snake is becoming more aggressive and could end up in a unnecessary tragedy that is one part and second part is by uh, asking the uh, rescuer to show the snake to you and all of those things you are causing further uh, distress for the animal so let the, let the rescuer pick up the snake and go his put the snake into the bag and go his way for releasing of the animal do not interfere and when the uh, rescuer is working please maintain a good distance from the rescuer don't we have this uh, this is a menace mobile phone you want to take that video to put it up on social media don't give the rescuer the space to work please yeah i am very passionate about that i'm sorry if i sounded a little aggressive on that but please keep that in mind mm. now coming back to the uh, macaques uh, i think we are overrunning i'll try to be a little fast uh Yeah. So one is uh, keep your doors and windows closed when you are not around. Uh, put up wire netting, grills on your those things on your uh, doors and windows. Do not leave food out in the balconies. And there is this whole belief that uh, these uh, monkeys and macaques, the, uh, the grey langurs and the most common ones that we would encounter are the bonnet macaques in south and the rhesus macaques up in the north and the grey langurs. are uh, uh, avatars of the hanuman of hanuman they are not avatars of hanuman please they are wild animals who have a place in our ecosystem and our environment uh, giving them food is uh, one of the most dangerous things because uh, they view you as submissive to them just imagine uh, uh, they 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 only subordinate or submissive animals will give food to the other animals so just to illustrate you know um, uh, think of the bully in your school when you are eating the chocolate if the bully comes what happens you give it give that chocolate to him submissively right i mean you may fight him whatever let's not go into that but uh, that, that that is the exact situation so giving them food they think you are submissive to them so they start expecting food so stop feeding them this is very important again like uh, food and garbage is going to attract them proper garbage management is necessary to keep the animals away from your places of dwelling so if you if you manage to keep that uh, follow these points they will they come why do they come they come because in search of food so uh not feeding them and making it difficult for them to get access to food around your your apartments or your society or your house will force them to migrate they will go in search of greener pastures so to speak and so on and so forth you know and please remember it's also illegal to feed them even in temples so i hope i've made that point clear uh yeah and if uh, this uh, thing does happen what do you do if you come face to face look away it actually disarms the situation they looking at them laughing at them, laughing at them is also laughing at their antics people laugh at their antics and laughing at them is also something that is uh, 
something uh, yes shravan i am addressing that point yes uh, uh, face to, uh, laughing at them is also some a show of submission to them you know so please avoid threatening them by making large loud noises and avoid direct eye contact not looking at them disarms them and prevents aggression on their part and also the children you know they they view children as playmates so just imagine this baby's a uh, two year old baby sitting with his legs played on the ground and uh, bending forward looks like a playmate of his size to the monkey so he comes curious but we panic and that panic causes the uh, animal to be aggressive and he lashes out thus injuring the baby so just imagine the situation it's actually an unwarranted thing which we inadvertently because of our panic cause harm to the harm to the baby and then in turn harm to the animal so try to secure the animal or gently without looking at them herd them away and they towards the uh, opening from the where they came you know like the window or the door or whatever and let them go do not be aggressive do not start to ask us yeah it is a fight we also will get into a fight and flight mode as i'm saying it i'm getting goose pimples you know we get into a fight and flight uh, fight or flight mode and we become loud we grab a stick we grab a chair and what not and so the animal also becomes aggressive so gently move them away control your pets because the pets also can cause the animal to uh, become uh, aggressive and in your apartment complex if you see a, a pm attack moving please let them go their way give them their space they they like i said wild animals will keep away from you but they you making them habituated to you by feeding them or by being aggressive to them so give them a wide berth give them their space they will coexist with us peacefully uh for other animals ideally call a, call for a rescue from the nearest shelter or from the rescue numbers which will be shared in this uh, deck also uh, shravan uh, shravanan is a is a rescuer uh, who is on this uh, call and he has been uh, helping me out with some points uh, uh, thanks shravan uh, i have to give you a shout out for being there like a little uh, the white angel on my shoulder not the red devil uh, anyhow next slide please if it's a stand the bird so there is a bird fly into buildings we have got this proliferation of glass buildings in our cities they fly into the building they are stunned and fall down or they get dehydrated and uh, fall down so what you need to do is just pick them up put them in a cardboard box lined with a towel or a cloth punch air holes in it and check after close the lid and check after 10 to 15 minutes at the most if the bird is okay when you open the door open the box the bird will he will fly away and congratulations you have made your first rescue right uh, if after that they still show distress or are not moving then call the rescuers or or take the bird straight to the wildlife shelter injured uh, other injured birds small mammals and other reptiles including orphan uh, when i say orphan is the, the baby squirrels or uh, macaques who have fallen down and the mothers have not reclaimed them then try and capture the animal as gently as possible uh, like preferably uh sakshi answering your question preferably using a towel to wrap the animal and put them into a cardboard box with air holes make sure the so for a small squirrel don't use a big box because a squirrel is going to run around and in all likelihood during transport hurt uh, himself just enough to restrain the animal in case of long neck birds keep the head close to the body and do not uh, like in case of uh, things like uh, like you may see a injured pelican on the lake do not attempt to rescue the bird please call a rescue because they are very delicate animals and uh, not delicate actually they are difficult to handle and the big bills that they have are razor sharp so do not when it's such big birds please call uh, call a rescue wait for them there's nothing else to do but wait for the rescue but also observe the animal so that you can watch whether they are moving usually injured animals will stay in the same place uh, and for the sake of clarity animals here birds and uh, birds are also animals Uh, which you, I'm sure you'd have understood by now because I keep referring to birds as examples also. Anyhow, uh, watch the animal, whether the animal moves away, so that you can tell the rescuer uh, and uh, uh, whether the, if the animal has moved away, and you can show them where the animal is. And Shravan makes a very uh, valid point, which I think I will read out, but uh, I don't think you should be uh, doing it. Uh, they must be confident about hand handling the species. which uh, with fear you should not have fear when you're trying to rescue the animal yeah i agree 
uh, completely agree with it because if you are uh, fearful, you will uh, the animal probably sense uh, will also sense it and it will make it all the more difficult, creating more trauma for the animals because they will try to move away from you and you will go after them, creating more trauma. So let's not do that and do not. Contrary to intuition and contrary to what many people say, do not attempt to force feed them, especially water. For instance, uh, a lot of people, they get these skies and pour water into the mouth because they feel that they are dehydrated. You can recognize signs of dehydration. But what is happening is the tracheal opening is on the tongue of the kite. And when you, open, when you pour water down the kite's mouth, you are literally drowning the kite. So don't feed them. Just restrain the animals, bring them to the shelter or call the rescuer to uh, bring them in and try to use as much as prote uh, protection as pos uh, possible. So this is the protocol for the smaller animals that you can handle. But for bigger animals, please wait for the rescue. And like I said, observe if the animal moves or not. Next slide, please. And in the case of like, uh, since Jacob brought up the uh, next slide, please, uh, Chico. Uh, in the case of uh, people living in farms which are adjoining forests, you may have encounters with uh, jackals and foxes and uh, leopards. Call the forest department. Please do not attempt to do anything with those animals, especially uh, the leopard can, if threatened, they usually keep away, but if they are injured and are threatened, they will not hesitate to attack. And uh, they, uh, we don't know what kind of pathogens they carry. <clears throat> oh, that's good. I can see multiple people uh, uh, saying answering yes to uh, having rescue experiences. I'm also getting yeses in the private chats as well. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. Okay, Divya is asking, are there any signs or way to know if the bird or animal is okay with accepting human help from humans when they are injured or in need of help? That's why I spoke about the five C's, uh, crying, coming towards you. So that's why if they, usually wild animals, Divya, they uh, go, don't approach you. But if they are approaching in a non-aggressive manner, they are in distress. So you can definitely go in and help them. Galaxy, uh, great. There are there are a lot of people who tend to ignore crows, but crows are also a part of our urban wildlife and important for our uh, ecology. Yes, uh, we need to uh, we need to save them also. Now, the last point uh, is private captivity. This is uh, uh, wildlife kept as pets, poached for meat or for other byproducts. Like for example, byproducts I mean is like uh, uh, monitor lizards are used for their meat, are used for their blood. They bleed the animal to death. They bleed them at 5, 10 ml at a time to uh, put into soda and uh, sell it for a couple of thousands, uh, thousand rupees a glass, saying that it gives, improves their virility and uh, uh, improves their virility and gives them strength. I mean, we are a population of uh, what seven and a half, eight billion in the in the across the globe, and we need more virility in us. I beg to differ, please. <laughs> so we definitely don't need that. Uh, and. Uh, yeah, so uh, it is illegal to keep any animal under captivity. So even keeping we, we, the animals we commonly see as uh, pets, squirrel, parrots or parakeets as they call, uh, miners, all these are illegal. So if you see people, animals, next slide please, the protocol here is do not attempt to engage. But if it is somebody you know, like for example, your neighbor has picked up a parakeet from some animal uh, from some market and uh, put a uh, put the animal in a cage and keeping it at home go since it's a neighbor you know the person you can go talk to them try to counsel them and see if they can give up the animal to you to hand over to a wildlife shelter great otherwise if it's somebody you see a house you're walking down jaynagar and you see uh, a, a parakeet in a cage hanging from the balcony do not engage with the person do not attempt to confiscate you do not have the power to confiscate and do not and if it is somebody selling the animal do not attempt to purchase the animal because uh, some well-meaning people may want to purchase it. You will not. Uh, you you are liable to be prosecuted. But instead, take pictures and gather evidence. The reason is, if you are going to get the seller alone, it's uh, it's not going to help. There's a larger chain there, you know. So uh, informing the forest department, they will be able to go up the chain and bust the chain if possible through the wildlife crime bureau and the vigilance department of the forest department. So. Inform the wildlife, uh, the forest department, or if you don't want to work with the forest department, you are, uh, I mean, people have that issue with bureaucracy. It's not that uh, they are hesitant about working with bureaucracy and police 